In this game, the first move came from a humble source, a lance of pike support tanks positioned on the crest of one of the few hills on these plains. They let loose with a fusillade from their combined total of 12 long-range autocannon, the high-pitched wail of their high-velocity shells announcing to all that the battle was joined. Lita did not wait for a signal from Jake. We have enemy contact bearing 110. Gamma Trinary, break and engage. Fire at will. It's been a while since we took some time to check in on the Magistracy of Canopus. As one of the more unique periphery states, there's value in taking the opportunity to see a different take on things like governance, weapon design, and the latest in cybernetic enhancements. So before we get started, let's pull up our live feed from Canopus. That looks sticky. Anyway, today we're going to take some time to appreciate the Pike. No, not that one, the 60 ton Pike support vehicle, which makes up for its lack of punch with a lot of loud noises. Sounds like it'll fit right in at that nightly rave, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. In a well-documented pattern throughout the history of the inner sphere, when the major states are in conflict with each other, the periphery states have some breathing room to grow. As the Third Succession War continued to grind the houses down between the 29th and 31st centuries, the Magistracy of Canopus had the opportunity to grow and take advantage of their distraction. Under the leadership of Magistrix Calia Centrella, the state would see significant economic development including the production of in-house weapon systems. One of those systems was a heavy vehicle first produced in 2987 which would be exported for sale and used defensively by the Magistracy. The Pike support vehicle isn't fast doesn't hit very hard, and isn't very well armored, but what it lacks and all of the basics needed to be a successful tool of modern warfare, it makes up with being inexpensive and available. Sometimes that's good enough. Unfortunately, plans to ship large numbers of the Pike into the Inner Sphere did not consider several factors which led to rather unimpressive sales. Basically, the vehicle wasn't expensive enough to be worth shipping all the way to the Inner Sphere. Trapped by economics, the Pike struggled to find homes outside of the periphery. Built around a Jones 180 emission kill internal combustion engine, the Pike's flank speed struggled to reach 54 kilometers per hour. The Pike's intended purpose was to provide flexible harassing fire at distance, which could pull attention away from frontline units. It didn't need to be fast for that goal. Nine tons of standard Star Slab 9 armor provided the vehicle with a modest 144 points of protection from light arms fire and the occasional direct hit from mech weapons, though if it got to that point, the Pike was likely in big trouble. There was an attempt to build the Pike in a way that limited its infrared signature, and it did have some success, however, it doesn't directly translate to the tabletop game with the original design. The Pike's primary weaponry was a trio of Zeus Bold II autocannons which could reach out to a great distance but paid for it with a lack of penetration damage. Backing up the autocannons were a pair of Marklin Mini Missile SRM-2 launchers. Overall, the damage output from the Pike is rather paltry, but as we'll see there is some power in numbers. While the major houses were pretty disinterested in buying the Pike, the Magistrix found an unlikely friend with Comstar who ended up buying a large number of pikes for use as inexpensive mobile defense platforms at hyperpulse generators off the beaten path. When one of these sites was attacked by Helmar Vasilik's pirate band, the pikes performed so well at harassing the raiders that Comstar ended up ordering the next four years of production from the Canopus Industries Alpha Factory. The Comguard tended to group five pikes together with the Demolisher, with the lighter tanks in support of the bigger tank as it did its work with its weapons. While just three AC-2s might not be impressive, 15 of them firing at a single target could be devastating. There was both safety and power in numbers. With modest sales, there was little motivation to dump more money into research and development for official variants of the pike. However, there were many field refits and one-off designs which used the vehicle as a functional platform. It's inexpensive and it just works turned out to be a fairly successful mantra for our poor beleaguered Pike. To no one's surprise, most of the common refits involved pulling out the AC-2s and replacing them with a different weapons loadout entirely. Starting in 2993, what was conveniently named the missile variant of the Pike began to appear among planetary defense forces. It was functionally the same as the original, 
though it pulled the three AC-2s in favor of two long-range missile 20 packs, along with three tons of ammunition. Though this may be tantalizing in comparison to the damage output of the AC-2s, it put the Pike up against the tried-and-true LRM carrier, which had been around for 500 years already, and fielded a third LRM-20 launcher at a comparable price. If you had a choice, the LRM carrier would be the smarter play. However, if you're in the periphery, you do with what you have. To its credit, retaining the SRM-2s helped the Pike not be quite so helpless as the LRM carrier should it end up being rushed. Overall, I'm okay with the LRM Pike. In 3004, a Pike variant was spotted that pulled those AC-2s, get used to that pattern, in favor of larger autocannons. The 2 AC-5 variant boosted the damage output of the Pike in exchange for a slightly reduced range. Thankfully, it also carried 7 tons of ammunition to keep the 2 AC-5s running, and the twin SRM-2s were retained. Of the classic Pikes, this one is the most likely to end up on any list I would generate, at least until we get further down the timeline. Leaping down that timeline almost 50 years, the next significant variant of the Pike is sometimes known as the Assault Pike, thanks to an upgrade to three rotary AC-2s from the original. This of course vastly improves the damage output of the autocannons. To facilitate this, the classic ice was pulled in favor of a fusion engine, which also came with a corresponding price increase. The SRM-2s were also sacrificed in favor of a small laser in the front of the vehicle. The rotary AC-2 can fire up to six shots in the same amount of time as a single AC-2 shot, so for just sheer volume of fire the damage potential goes up. Of course that does come with the not insignificant risk of jamming the weapon, so there's always the risk versus reward of going all in. They also cannot fire specialty ammunition, which can be a downside if you're into that sort of thing. Presumably, through their contact with the Calm Guard on Tukiad, there was a clan refit of the Pike which took the tank a different direction. Now, as with any clan refit, it's automatically going to benefit from the weight savings and other quirks of clan technology. The biggest change was the shift up to a 180 fusion engine, which brought some weight while maintaining the movement profile. In the turret, five Ultra AC-2s were installed. So let's do the math. Five autocannons, double firing, 10 shots, two damage apiece, up to 20 damage, and what would essentially be a shotgun-like effect on the target. That's just dangerous enough to be a problem, though still not quite so distracting that it would make the tank a primary target. That's right where the Pike wants to be. The addition of 8.5 tons of ferrofibrous armor improves the strength of the Clan Pike as well. 45 damage on the front is downright respectable. There's still a chance of your UACs jamming, so that does have to be considered. However, the Clan Pike is not a terrible option for just shy of 900 battle value. Taking a huge leap forward down the timeline, the next variant arrived in the relatively recent year of 3134. Ah, the good old days. The 3130s were wild, weren't they? Feels like just yesterday. We were so young and idealistic. Man. Where was I? Ah yes, the LBX version of the Pike takes advantage of the Magna 180 fuel cell instead of the barbaric and primitive internal combustion engine. This allowed for the swap to a trio of LB5Xs instead of those old cruddy AC2s. Ferrofibrous armor bulked up the Pike's defenses a bit, and the SRM-2s were retained just out of tradition, I suppose. I'd just put Inferno missiles in them for fun. The LB-5Xs are effective against air targets and could do quite a bit of harassing and crit-seeking on already damaged battle mechs. Remember, the original goal was to create a tank that could harass larger targets at distance. The LBX version of the Pike does exactly that. Our last official Pike variant is a devilish design produced by Clan Seafox. The Plasma Pike. Oh yeah, here we go. With the weight savings that comes with the 180 fusion engine and a swap over to ferrofibrous armor, the Plasma Pike fields three plasma cannons, two streak SRM-2s, and a targeting computer. Now it's been a while since we covered the plasma cannon, so real quick, here's how it breaks down. A creation of Clan Diamond Shark way back in the rough and tumble days in 3069, the plasma cannon was a result of the clan's efforts to convert plasma fusion technology into a reliable long-range weapon. Just a year before, the Capellans had successfully produced their first plasma rifle, and the plasma cannon would use the same principle. The Diamond Shark plasma cannon was smaller and took up less space than the Capellan plasma rifle, but lacked the direct damage capability against armor plate. While the plasma rifle does 10 damage to armored targets and 1d6 heat, the plasma cannon generates 2d6 heat against its target. 
burning unit that isn't a mech, aerospace fighter, or vehicle, the plasma cannon does 3d6 damage in 5 damage groupings, each applied to a different random location if the target has separate damage locations. With 3 plasma cannons, the pike could easily cap out the heat generation against a mech in a single turn, and it would be absolutely devastating to infantry and battle armor. The added accuracy from the targeting computer is great, as well as those two streak SRM-2s. All around a vehicle that could be quite a wild card if your opponent is running infantry or battle armor, or an energy heavy battle mech that is light on the heat sinks. Of course we can't go without a mech frog variant of the pike, so here we go. First things first, we're swapping out that ice for a fuel cell and boosting the armor to 10.5 tons of light ferrofibrous. This bulks up the vehicle a bit for what we have planned later. The AC-2s are history in favor of four light AC-5s, along with six tons of ammunition. For the record sheet provided in the video comments below, I've included two tons of armor-piercing ammunition. The light AC-5s give up some of that range but retain their five damage output, making the four of them together a respectable threat to most targets. I know the light AC-5s have their detractors, but in this case, I think the LAC-5 is a good option. Weight is an issue though, so the best I could do for those close range fighting moments is to give the Pike MF all the machine guns. All of them. It got, it got all of them. Three in the front, one on each side, and one aiming out the rear. All of them fed with a single ton of ammunition. What we're left with here is a good mid-range vehicle that can pump out up to 20 damage per turn out to 15 hexes. While not breaking any records, the Pike MF would earn its keep by being just annoying enough to be harmful but not quite so terrifying that it gets focused fired into oblivion at the earliest opportunity. So why do we love the Pike? Overall, it's an interesting demonstration of how autocannon technology languished as laser tech and double heat sinks took the main stage in the battlefields of the 31st century. Providing harassing fire at great distance is not a bad thing, but at two damage a shot, those AC-2s are simply too heavy in comparison to the alternative weapons. It's not that the Pike is a bad tank, it's just not a great one, and that is unfortunate. Thank you as always for coming by today to talk some Battletech. If you thought the video was worthwhile, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button so that YouTube knows it's worth showing to others. Going the extra step to becoming a channel member for a few bucks a month goes a long way to making sure I can keep this project going. Thank you to those who are already members, I really appreciate it. Until we meet again, Take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.